Tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, I have um, all sorts of stories from my misspent youth, but um, one of the things that happened as a result of my misspent youth is I ended up being a motivational speaker to young people. I was a youth communicator, um, so I used to travel around schools and talk about you know, getting on with friends and bullying and drugs and those sorts of things, which was uh, a lot of fun. I once did a talk to a whole bunch of young people who were unemployed at MSD and um, had to fit give these people these um, feedback forms to write out. And the best piece of feedback I ever got was, he was kind of like a demented What Now presenter. Um, <laughs> so that was fantastic. But I have all sorts of memories from this hall, from coming into this school and speaking. Um, and the longer I did it, the sillier I got. Um, and it just, I just had more and more fun with it. I have this really vivid memory, as does Tim, of standing over there and the seats were all pointed that way. And I had to hand out these handbooks and these pens. And I said to the kids, we can do this the safe way or we can do this the fun way. Um, and they all picked fun way, which just meant I like biffed pens at them. And I, where did I hit you? I hit you like right in the head, eh? Yeah, that's cool. So <laughs> there's no link to that story. Yeah. It's just I threw a pen, it hit um, Tim really hard in the head. And that explains a lot about his fashion sense. Um, <laughs> love you, bro. Love you. I feel like we've talked about the houses so much that we're all going to end up in houses by the end of this. Like, we'll be ripping different teams. It'll be great. Okay, we are doing an introduction to Luke and Acts. We are going to be in the book of Luke Acts, the book of Luke Acts for the next forever. Uh, So Luke Acts is one unified story told in two parts. If you look at the start of Luke and if you look at the start of Acts, it's pretty clear that they're written by the same author with the same intention. And we know all sorts about Luke because of the book of Acts. Like there's this really fun transition that happens where Luke is talking about them and they, and then it says, then it starts talking about we and us because Luke was one of Paul's traveling companions. You read about him in Philemon and the book of Colossians, which are basically the same book, just two different letters sent at the same time. Wow, that was a lot of talking about a lot of stuff. Luke is cool. Let's jump straight into it. So, The book of Luke is one of the earliest accounts that we have. I don't know if any of you have ever fallen down the rabbit hole of like, which came first, Matthew, Mark, or Luke? All we know for certain is that John came last. We know that because the last like little chapter of John, John describes a running race where he beat Peter and you have to wait till all the other disciples are dead (laughs) before you can write a story where you go, guys, just to settle things, I won, right? But Luke, Matthew, Mark, there's all sorts of discussions about which order they came in, but all we do know is it's one of the earliest um, stories that we have about the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. And we'll just start right at the start. This is how Luke starts his, um, well, we call it a gospel these days. Gospel is... um, Another way of saying good news, which is another way of saying euangelion was the Greek word. It's the good news according to Luke, and this is how he starts it. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. There are so many amazing things going on in there. But first and foremost, I just want to highlight one thing. Luke decided to write an orderly account which is a really flash way of saying Luke decided to tell us a story. He decided to tell us a story, and it's not just any story. It's a story about the things that have been fulfilled. The word fulfilled shows us why Luke was so focused on writing these books. For him, the story of Jesus isn't merely ancient history. He wants, us to show, he wants to show us how it's the fulfillment of the long covenant of the story of God and the story of Israel. And on a larger scale, it's the story of God's covenant faithfulness to his creation and his created beings and to all humanity who are all invited to take part in the new creation that has burst forth into the world in and through Jesus. Like, it is an amazing story 
And it's not just an ancient historical story. It's a story that was told back then, which we retell because this story transforms us. Um, it transforms us, and we believe it has the power to transform the world. Yes? Yeah. That's why we tell it over and over again. So that's actually, I'm talking about Luke, but that's actually how the Bible works in general. It is a story. And what this story does often is it actually disorients us and then it reorients us. I don't know if you've had that experience of thinking one thing or believing one thing and then being presented with different information and it's disorienting because then you've got to reevaluate and reorient yourself. But what we believe about the Bible is this is the true story about the nature of the world and about how we were created to live and move and have our being. And so these stories are so important to spend time in. To be human is to inhabit narratives. We are storytelling people, and we tell stories because stories make sense of or sense make the world. And we are formed by all sorts of different stories. There's actually like this competition going on in our world for which story is going to frame and shape us. It's competing stories. There's stories like, if my political party were in charge, all the problems in the world would be fixed. <laughs> That's going to happen a lot over the next six months. We're going to hear a lot of that story. There's the story of, if I just had more, I'd be happy. There's the story of, if I'm sad, if I buy something, I'll feel good about myself. There are these meta-framing stories. And then Luke is presenting in amongst all those stories, this story and saying this story about this thing that has been fulfilled in Jesus. This is the story. This is the po hitting a waka. This is, the, this is what you want to bind yourself to because this story is the story. But it can be destabilizing. It can be strange. There are lots of strange things in Luke and Acts that you force you to go, whoa, do I really believe that? You know, there's that story where Jesus rises from the dead. You guys heard that one before? It's crazy. There's that story where he's hanging out with his disciples, then he's like leaders and floats up into the sky. You guys heard that one? There's that story in Acts where there's that guy who's listening to Paul talk late into the night, falls out of the window. Paul goes downstairs, gives him a hug. He comes back to life, and Paul keeps doing his Bible study. You heard that one? <laughs> right? There's that one where, like, a handkerchief of Paul's get, is getting passed around cities, and people are getting healed by touching the hanky. Yeah? You heard that one? There's that one where, like, flaming tongues float above people's heads, and they start speaking in different languages, and people think they're drunk? Yeah. You guys heard that one? Like, th these stories actually are, are disorienting, and then you've got to lean into them and reorient yourself to them and go, well, if that is true, then what does that mean for how I live my life? And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing by spending time in Luke X. Uh, I read this book recently. I don't actually recommend you read it, but I'm showing you because it was cool. Um, it's by a theoretical physicist called Carlo Rovialli. Um, it's called Aniximanda and the Nature of Things. It's basically a book about epistemology, like how we know what we know and how we change our opinions about things as we're presented with new information. And he tells this story from the ancient history Herodotus, the ancient historian Herodotus. And all the Greeks back in the time of Herodotus thought that the world was about 20 generations old and they could all trace their descendants back 16 generations to like a divine God. And so Herodotus and his mate Heracles, um, Heratus, I can't say his name, went to ancient Egypt, and they were like, yeah, 16 generations ago, I'm descended from a God. And these Egyptian priests go, come here, come here, come here, come here. Every single one of the priests in this temple who has been high priest has set up a carving to denote their time as high priest. Come and count them with me, Right? 345 generations of these, like, of these Po. And so these Greek guys were forced to reevaluate the stories that they told themselves in light of this new story, the Gospel of Luke, the story of Jesus, the story of the Bible. It invites us to do exactly the same thing. So I want to point out that there are, oh, I'm not going to actually read those quotes, which is cool. I want to point out that of all the stories, there are two massive stories that actually are competing the most in our world and in our cultural climate. Do you want to guess what they are? Should we do a bit of Q&A? No? Great. The two biggest framing stories. One, there is no God. 
All there is is what we can see, touch, measure. There's nothing after this. There was nothing before this. This is all there is. And as a result, the best thing that you can do is have as much fun as possible before you die. That's one massive framing story. And what Luke is introducing us to is that there's another story, that there is a God, that there's this and then there's more, and that more is as real as this, but it's hard to measure, taste, touch, but you can experience it. And we know that what the nature of this God is like because it's revealed to us in the person of Jesus and then through his presence, the Holy Spirit, and through his word. And you can step into that and experience the truth of that and that world in an entirely different way. And the way we get access to that is through connection with God and experiencing the Holy Spirit and reading his word and relationship and prayer. These are the two stories. And Luke is trying to say, it's been fulfilled. It's true. This is good news. This is the true reality of the world. I was a raging atheist as a teenager. Um, I should show you some more photos at some point. I was a really, really um, funny looking guy. But I remember meeting these Christians and sitting down and having this conversation with them. And I was telling them all the reasons why they were stupid. (laughs) And then this guy started telling me stories of the miraculous stuff that he had seen. Oh, hey. That's so cool, buddy. Can you say hi, everyone? You show everyone your picture. Whoa. That's so good. All right, hi, Yatu. There we go. And then this guy started telling me these miraculous things that he had seen. Now, according to the evangelism books, you don't start with your weird God stories, right? But we've all got weird God stories, these unexplainable things that have happened that point to the truth and the reality of the fact that there's something more. This story is a story about weird God things, people raising from, rising from the dead, people floating into the sky, but we believe that they're true. These guys started telling me their weird God stories. They'd been on this missions trip in Africa, and they'd seen people be physically healed from stuff. And what those stories did to me and my raging atheist mind is it made me ask this question, and it's potentially one of the most dangerous questions you can ask. What if what they are saying is true? And if it is true... What does that mean for how I live here and now? What does it mean for how I live today? At the baseline of everything, this church thing that we're doing, this Christianity thing that we're doing, it all boils down to that. If it's true, then what does it mean for how I live here and now? That's it. And so that's what we're going to do with Luke. Now, Luke's way of telling us this truth is not to be like, um, dear reader, I want to tell you that there was a guy called Jesus. He was the son of God. He was God in person. Therefore, believe in him. It'll change your life, right? Luke adopts this amazing strategy to tell us this truth. Uh, We call it narrative theology. And there's this author I like, a guy called Richard B. Hayes, who has this amazing quote about how Luke works as a gospel. He says this, We might picture Luke's narrative technique in the following way. It is as though the primary action of the gospel is playing out in the center stage in, um, in floodlights, while a screen at the back of the stage displays a kaleidoscope series of flickering seeping tone images from Israel's scriptures. I love that. So there's this picture of Luke's highlighting what's going on here and in, in like on a stage, but at the back of the stage, there's these like grainy, sepia, flickering images of Old Testament stories. Everyone still with me? The images can flash by almost unnoticed. However, if the viewer pays careful attention, there are many moments in which the words or gestures of the characters on stage mirror something in the shifting backdrop or possibly the other way around. At such moments of synchronicity, the viewer may experience a flash of humanetical insight. I love this. When you see these connections, did I give you more? Nah, I didn't, that's all you got. When you see these connections, between what's happening back here and what's happening in the foreground, you get this flash of humanetical insight. That means you get this moment of revelation where you can see something that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And then he goes on, but it's not Luke's style to develop sustained sequences in which the patterns coincide or run parallel. Rather, 
almost as soon as we recognize one of these convergences, the moment has passed. He goes on to say this. For purpose of analysis, we can freeze the action and study it slowly, but it's not the effect created for the reader or the hearer. The story keeps moving and leaves us with a powerful but indistinct sense of analogy between God's saving acts for Israel in the past and the new liberating events coming to fulfillment in the story of Jesus. Thus, Many of the Old Testament echoes in Luke do not function as a, there's a cool sentence, direct typological prefiguration of events in the life of Jesus. Rather, this is cool, rather they create a broader and subtler effect. They create a narrative world. Okay, that was a lot. I'll say that in a different way. Luke creates a narrative world which tells the story of Jesus while telling that it's the fulfillment of the Israel story. And in that narrative world, he invites you to bring your story so that your story gets um, woven into that narrative world and you then become another of the characters living out the mission of Jesus. That's how Luke and Acts works. You see the foreground, you see the background, and then you become part of the action yourself with how you live your life here and now. You are invited to inhabit the narrative. So this, this thing happens all the time. The like on the background, there's one thing, and in the foreground, there's another one. Here are just a few examples. The story of Zephaniah, um, of Zechariah and Elizabeth right at the start of Luke. They are an elderly couple who have been faithful to God their whole life who can't have kids. Sounds similar? Abraham and Sarah, you get the prayer of Mary, which is very, very similar to the prayer of Hannah. And then you take that prayer and those two stories and look at them together and you go, wow, Jesus is, God's doing this miraculous thing. Or you look at Jesus glowing on the mountain and then you look at Moses glowing on the mountain and you look at the similarities between the two and you're invited into the story. Or you look at um, Jeremiah confronting injustice at the temple and then Jesus standing in exactly the same spot and confronting injustice in the temple. And you go, which character am I in this story? Oops, I've become the person that is perpetuating injustice, even though I've been warned over and over again. Do you see how this works? And then it works at this like much bigger level as well. Like the same way that John the Baptist precedes Jesus in the gospel, in Acts you get Peter preceding Paul. Or if you look at the way that um, Luke tells the um, uh, what am I trying to say here? The garden scene and then the cross scene in his gospel. And then you look at how he tells the shipwreck scene in the end of Acts. There are all these parallels where you see that Paul is re, um, re-experiencing what Jesus experienced. And then the question is, will you do that too? Will you step into the pattern? Will you step into the story? There's this um, global church movement called Acts 29, and I'm not that into the movement, but I am into the concept. The concept is the book of Acts finishes at 28, but we as the church are to be writing chapter 29. We're invited to inhabit and then carry on the story. Okay, I'm going to read you one more quote, and then we're going to wrap up. Actually, I'm going to read you two more quotes. I lied. This is, um, oh, and I'm killing it for time. This is brilliant. Henry Nouwen, if you've never read any of his work, um, you should. He's phenomenal. He was this incredibly um, well-known, well-respected lecturer, professor at like Harvard, Yale, all these flash schools. And he inhabited these stories so much that he handed in his um, positions at all these schools and went and lived in a small community for people with intellectual um, disabilities and served them for the rest of his life. Like he's this guy who took the downward um, story, the Paschal mystery of the gospel and applied it to his life and lived it out. And so I've got a heap of time for what he says. Here he is talking about the experience of the disciples who had believed that Jesus had died and that was the end of the story. And so they were on the road to Emmaus. And I love the way here that Henry Nouwen captures the weaving of stories that both Luke does, but also Jesus does. And he says something here which is true of the experience of engaging with this story. Let me just read it to you. So a stranger appearing from no, a stranger appears from nowhere, yet one who somehow seems closer than anyone who had ever told their story. The loss, the grief, the guilt, the fear, 
The glimpses of hope and the many unanswered questions that battled for their attention and their restless minds, all of these were lifted up by the stranger and placed in the context of a story much larger than their own. What had seemed so confusing began to offer new horizons. What had seemed so oppressive began to feel liberating. What had seemed so extremely sad began to take on the quality of joy. As he talked to them, they gradually came to know that their little lives weren't as little as they had thought, but part of a great mystery that not only embraced many generations, but stretched itself out from eternity to eternity. The stranger didn't say that there was no reason for sadness, but that their sadness was part of a larger sadness in which joy was hidden. The stranger didn't say that the death they were mourning wasn't real, but that it was a death that inaugurated even more life, real life. The stranger didn't say that they hadn't lost a friend who had given them new courage and new hope, but that this loss would create the way to a relationship far beyond any friendship they had ever experienced. Never did the stranger deny what they had told him. To the contrary, he affirmed it as part of a much larger event in which they were allowed to play a unique role. This is what the Gospel of Luke does. It invites us to see our story as part of a much bigger story where our sadness and our pain and our disappointment gets caught up and reborn and recreated and given new life in which we're giving new purpose and new meaning and new hope to partner with Jesus in the ongoing creation of the world. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Ultimately, this whole book, both the book of um, the good news about Jesus and the acts of Jesus in and through the early church, they point to Jesus. And so I'll finish with one last quote, and then I'll pray. This is um, old mate, old mate Murray Roberts, who wrote a fantastic book um, called The Future of Humanity, which is all about the book of Revelation. I love this. This is how he summarizes it. He says, the cross reveals to humankind the very nature of God. He has revealed himself to us as someone who loves us enough to take on our humanity, carry our sorrows, to bear our sins, to suffer and die for us. Not only is the cross the means of our redemption, it is also the pattern for our discipleship. We are called to take up our cross and to follow Jesus, to become a servant, bringing God's healing love to the world and to identify with the poor, the lost and the oppressed. So Jesus, as we are invited into Luke's narrative world, as we are invited to inhabit this story, which is ultimately a story about you. Jesus, we pray that you will disorient us and disorient the stories that we bring to this that mean that we miss what you are doing. And then we pray that you will reorient our hearts, our minds, and our lives to who you are, to the truth of who you are, and to what you are, are doing and still dream of doing in our world, in our church, in our community, in our neighborhood, that we would be your cross-shaped people in the world, that we would be strengthened by your Holy Spirit, that we would know your voice, and that we would be courageous enough to follow you. We ask all this in your powerful name. Amen.